Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 17, titled French Twist. Which is interesting to me because we just had Florence, Italy last week. Miami Vice is becoming very international. (laughs) Exotic. (laughs) Prostitutes are welcome from every country on Miami Vice. (laughs) Well, clearly. (laughs) It originally premiered on February 21st, 1986. The director was David Jackson, who is a very accomplished TV director. He'll direct four more episodes of Miami Vice, and he has a laundry list of stuff that he did in the 80s and 90s, uh, even up to today. The writers, there's two of them, Michael Hagen, who is the story editor for like half of the episodes of Miami Vice. So he's he's around for the whole run of the show, basically, too. And then there's this other guy so, named so no, Jaren. So no fake writers this year? No, like, <laughs> no. Um, goofy names? Um, no. No, I mean, unless you count the other writer, his name is Jaren Summers. And uh, this is the only thing he ever did. So, <laughs> And that might be good. That might be a good thing. I don't know if that's – did you check his Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Before we get started with chickens, who was going to each other's lives. And, guys, it's that time of year. It's a lot of work. School's coming to an end. There's just not a whole lot going on right now. So I'm going to challenge you. Melissa, I'm going to cut right to you in this. Oh, great. Thanks gonna, a lot. <laughs> we're an 80s podcast. I'm going to make you choose the ultimate 80s question. What? G.I. Joe or Transformers? Um, Can you ask me a hard question? <laughs> <laughs> no, for the record, in the morning before I went to school, every single morning in elementary school, probably up to like fifth grade, I watched G.I. Joe. Mm. I did love G.I. Joe, but Transformers, they cut me deep when they got rid of, <laughs> they got rid of Optimus. Mm-hmm. So, and I never really went back to it when they brought him back. As, I mean, I did, but I just didn't love it as much as I loved it with Optimus on. So I don't think anyone don't really went back once they brought Optimus back, which is why I'm suggesting that perhaps the better franchise is G.I. Joe. Um, well, you can suggest it all you want, but that's not <laughs> true. Because remember, don't make me get deep in this, because remember, they got rid of Duke, too. They killed true. in the G.I. Joe movie. Mm-hmm. What true. kind of crap was that? <laughs> <laughs> Could afford both The Rock and Channing Tatum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How much money do you think they have? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I meant, and I actually met in the animation movie for GI Joe, the cartoon movie that they put out in the eighties. They they killed Duke off. Mm. They did the same thing. Hmm. So I picked Transformers because of my, my love for Optimus Prime. If that <laughs> if he was a real man, I would have wanted to marry him when I was a kid. So, but he so was just a I'm robot. I'm just gonna throw this out there. The cartoon I used to watch before I went to school was Voltron. Uh, yeah, we don't talk about in this house because Voltron, Voltron. is not up there up to the par with Transformers. <laughs> now Dominic I'm, I'm, loves Voltron. Quiet. Dominic <laughs> loves Voltron and so does Demetrius. So I'm very happy it's back on Netflix, but we're taking it slow. It's killing it's killing our son how slowly we are watching that show. Yeah, like a snail's <laughs> for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go over and talk about this episode because like a snail. This one struggles to get started. <laughs> but I, I think it delivers at the end. We have we have some we we eventually get there. We have a very short episode. Uh not episode, but we have a very short opening, which is unlike what we've had for like the last five or six weeks. This one gets straight to the point. We open up at the Miami Medical Center, a Three Stooges like delivery van comes pulling into the Miami (laughs) Medical Center. This black and white striped horizontal stripes. And I'm thinking, I will say this. I will say this. It's always nice to see a milkman in this day and age. (laughs) The van pulls in and is delivering a box, and immediately I'm suspicious. This is a weird looking van. This isn't a regular (laughs) FedEx truck. It's it's weirdly, it's really short. Where's his shorts? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What? (laughs) The man says he's got a package he has to deliver to Dr. Dr. Roscoe. This is all sound of faith. The doctor comes up and says, no, he's out. I'll sign for it. And then the doctor kills the delivery man, gets in the truck, and drives away. Yeah, who saw that <laughs> coming? I thought for sure the delivery man was, w- was, was going to be the, the assassin. Killer. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, doctor comes out of nowhere and just goes, just murders him. Meanwhile, in the background, there's a woman torturing a man stuck in a wheelchair after <laughs> multiple injuries, and laughing while she takes his picture. <laughs> skateboard injuries. He did all that skateboarding. Did anyone else wonder what he did to do that skateboarding? Like he had a broken arm and a broken leg. What was he jumping off of? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the mid '80s, so he's probably in a swimming pool. Probably yeah, an empty probably. swimming pool. <laughs> yeah, everyone had one. Back <laughs> then <laughs> <laughs> so cindy is her name she's taking a picture of her boyfriend david he got injured in a skateboarding apparently it, i'm starting to think that maybe she's into extreme sports and she's gonna take him back there in the wheelchair <laughs> <laughs> push him off <laughs> <laughs> she sees this happening in the background and takes some pictures of it happening very nicely and announces to all of us watching he killed a man and i have the proof no one said she was the smartest girl, okay? <laughs> She's dim. She's very dim. <laughs> and then that's the end of the opening and we go to the we go to the opening credits. But I do want to stop here for just a second and point out that Cindy is actually someone who's very you if you are a fan of 80s and early 90s movies, you will recognize her right away. Yeah, she is Sherry Headley, uh Headley, Headley, Headley. I like Headley. <laughs> I'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, she is Sher- Sherry Heatley. She actually started with a brief appearance on the Cosby Show, but her film debut is Coming to America with Eddie Murphy, where she played Lisa McDowell. When I saw her, I was like, I I don't know, I'm not 100 percent sure. She's so young. Uh, I was like, I'm pretty sure, but Melissa, you spotted it from a mile away. Yeah, when you said you said she goes, oh, she's she was in Coming to America. She must be like a side character or something. And I was like, no, it, because I have seen that. Obviously, I've seen the Miami Vice episode, and it clicked in my head. I'm like, no, she's the main girl. It's the girl because. She that's who she is, and I knew who right away. <laughs> I, I, I was like, How started you wondering, know? like, who, who's that guy with the jerry curl? That was her boyfriend, uh, Eric LaSalle. It was yeah, Eric LaSalle, LaSalle exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it'd be pre ER days. That, yeah. that's, that, that's where my mind went. So, but she was also briefly married from 93 to 95 with to Christopher Play Martin of Kid and Play. Hold on a second, Funny I'm gonna. Sto- I'm gonna I'm doing the kid and play out here in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, it doesn't get more 80s than that, right? Kid and play. Like, not mm-hmm. there could not be more yeah, 80s than that. that. <laughs> the whole house party trilogy. Yep, exactly. Um, I love those movies. <laughs> so, funny story. They divorced in 95. They have a kid together. In 1995, Chris Martin became a born-again Christian and started doing Christian rap. Yeah, she broke him. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Her other notable roles, if you watch soap operas, she was Detective Mimi Reed in All of My Children from 91 to 95, and then reprised it again in 2005. She was also spent a year on The Guiding Light in 2001-2002, and a year with The Bold and the Beautiful in 2004 and 2005. Well, you know, it's credit to the people who do soap operas. Operas. I, and it's easy to laugh at them, but the stories are so ridiculous and the sets are so shoddy. Credit to them being able to hold it together under such terrible conditions. <laughs> <laughs> so when we come out of the credits, we go to Paris, and it's pretty obvious it's a if we're in Paris because we do a literal flyover at the Eiffel Tower because you know in Paris everything happens inside the Eiffel Tower. They just like the the into- all of the government and everything is inside of the inside of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Where they eat baguettes and drink wine. <laughs> it's spilled to the brim with French fries. They're everywhere. <laughs> uh-huh. A Frenchman, very over the top Frenchman, pencil thin mustache, oh, beret, <laughs> striped shirt. <laughs> he comes in, delivers a blue Carrying envelope. Carrying a loaf of bread with him. <laughs> <laughs> He comes in, delivers a blue envelope to a woman who then gives him cash. They, he very handily spreads the Monopoly cash money, out. Monopoly money, Dominic. M- Monopoly money. <laughs> so the it's woman not then, real money. So. <laughs> the woman then carries the folder and, and just small observation. She's wearing the same color shoes as the folder. It's really bothering me when, during that scene. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why did they do that? The woman then takes the folder to another man. And he is Leonard Cohen, the late, great Hall of Fame musician, Leonard Cohen. Canadian. 
musician. <laughs> Don really wants that in there. He's Canadian. <laughs> they don't have very many Hall of Fame ones. You have to give them one when they get it. <laughs> hey, Mixed hey. in there with Huey Lewis and Rush as a real musician in Leonard Cohen. <laughs> Ouch, Rush. Brian somewhere. Adams. Ouch. <laughs> yeah, okay. We've got Brian Adams. You need to get that one. <laughs> Cohen then makes a phone call and he says – that she has found Bandy in the U.S. He's stolen the morphine and plans to sell it. He's in Miami. We go back over to Miami. So that's pretty much the only time we see Paris. There's like one other scene where Cohen will come back and, and make another phone call. But other than that, we don't we don't travel back to Paris again. Which I couldn't figure out the whole morphine theft thing being a part of this. I mean, I guess, I don't know. I guess there's a shortage of morphine in France, and so they have to steal <laughs> it from Miami. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, it was kind of weird for, like, an international person to be involved in it, right? Like, that seems like that's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> Interpol heavily monitors morphine traffic, uh, apparently. apparently. <laughs> we go back to the hospital in Miami, and Tubbs and Crocker are checking down on the driver. The doctor comes out and says he was a fighter, but he just didn't make So on their way out, Tubbs is talking to Crocker, and he says that there was morphine in the truck. It's legal in the U.S., but they could sell it on the street. They could probably make a bunch of money. Crockett sees a newspaper on the counter of the hospital. It has a big old picture of Cindy on his hand. And with the headline, witness a murder and took pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, teen so, witnesses murdered. <laughs> so Cindy's dead. So now what happens in the episode? <laughs> well, that's just what we're all waiting for, right? Because we know now Miami Vice has to go take her in. And the worst thing that could ever happen to you is to be under protective custody of Miami Vice. Or just Tubbs, actually. <laughs> yes. Tubbs don't know what yes. the hell he's doing, okay? You can't yeah, go to sleep when you're protected. He does some crack police work trying to protect this girl. And when it comes to that point, I have a I have a comment about when it comes to that that uh, scene because uh, let's just mm. get real here. This is the second time he's tried to fall asleep when he's supposed to be protecting somebody, and it's gone <laughs> <True>. bad. Uh, <laughs> it's like it's two weeks in a row with the prostitute. <laughs> he fell asleep when she tried to, or she killed herself in front of him. I mean, <laughs> we go over to the precinct, and Cindy's looking through a whole bunch of mug shots. The duo and Swite Tech go in to see Castillo, and he says that Interpol has contacted him. They know who it is that they're looking for. His name is Surat Bondi. He's a drug mule who moves only in kilos. He only moves in volume. And the Mounties almost got him. <laughs> almost got him in Canada, Dominic. Dudley do right is still looking for him. He's patrolling all over the border. They can't find him. But they want him back alive for capital punishment, which I was unaware. Canada strikes me as a country that does not have capital punishment. Um, they don't. It's not I really mean, capital punishment. No, I'm I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess a paddling would be capital punishment <laughs> to them. <laughs> they let a moose lick you like, for hours tied up. <laughs> well, you have maple syrup all over your body. No, I know, I couldn't think of anything more so, Canadian. <laughs> I did want to mention the guy who plays Sandy. His name is Xavier Coronel. He did mostly Spanish speaking films. He did have a role. He did have roles in Days of Thunder, Toll Booth, and Speed Two Cruise Control. <laughs> I just that love name. that name. I know. I just... Yes, yes, fantastic. You got to keep the boat over thirty-two knots. Um, <laughs> I want to bring him up because this is his biggest role in the show, but not his only role or character in the show that he plays. In this episode, he plays Surat Bandy. In the episode Redemption in Blood, he will play an unnamed Elgato aide. <laughs> and in the episode Freefall, he plays a so-called so tourism director. Mm. <laughs> so-called? If you call yourself yeah, that. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't know about the inflection or why, so we haven't gotten that far. Once again, Vice reusing actors for bit parts. <laughs> My favorite thing that happens in this scene is that Tubbs, Tubbs and Crockett don't know who this guy is, but as soon as Tubbs sees his picture, sees Bondi's picture, he says, quote, believe me, he's no chump. <laughs> because he's a good judge of character from pictures alone. <laughs> so we also find out that Interpol is going to send an inspector. Her, the name is Daniel Hire. She's coming to America, going to come help. There's some. The, the name here is important because everyone in the episode assumes that Daniel Hire is a man, but it's Danielle Hire that is coming. Well, for the record, I think only Castillo 
assume she was a man. He said Daniel, and then and then for whatever reason, how did Crockett know that was her when she walked in? He's like, oh, there she is. <laughs> True. That yeah, because Crockett knows that. Okay, the next scene, this is real quick at the hotel where Crockett's waiting for her. She comes in, and then she's just all business. He goes and says hi, tries to make small talk. She's like, take me to the person that take me to the witness. But he knows right away it's Tubbs later, like Daniel. Oh yeah, woman. that's right. He does yeah. make a yeah. He's like. Yeah, because apparently you cannot be a woman in a policeman, according to Tubbs. <laughs> in the drive over to the safe house, there's a little bit of banter between the two where Crockett says uh, she's safe with his partner, which we know we all know that's a joke. <laughs> she ain't safe with him. No. <laughs> when we get to the safe house, Tubbs is playing cards with Cindy, and she asks if – so this is great because she asks if Tubbs has a girlfriend and then immediately asks, what about Crockett because he's so good looking? Well, he is. I mean <laughs> – <laughs> but she's just like, hey, Tubbs, I just want you to know I'm like trying to schmooze you to get to Crockett. Exactly. And <laughs> it should be noted she's a teenage what? girl, though. She's not a woman. She's a teenage girl because she's talking about going to prom and stuff. So let's mm-hmm. get that straight. <laughs> That's why they're going to she get all pissy with Danny. I don't What's know. What's that? Did you notice? Like, she got all like pissy with Danny. Yeah. She, no, no. She, Danielle. Oh, yeah. She didn't like her. Yeah. I think she was like, um, like jealous. She was yeah, trying to make her jealous or something. Because when Crockett and Hires show up, she like climbs all over Tubbs and like pretends to kiss him on the neck and says she says she Hire asks Cindy for the information again and she says no, I already told it to Crockett and Tubbs. Like leave me alone with these men. Um, I think mm-hmm. she's a better judge of character than Tubbs and Crockett. So she didn't <laughs> like her. She was like, I don't like you right away. I'm not going to tell you uh-huh. anything because I don't like you because she's uh, because a 17 year old has better judgment than Tubbs <laughs> and Crockett. Well, definitely Crockett when it comes to women. Let's face that. <laughs> yeah. Hire gets the story from Cindy and then her and Crockett take off. Sonny tells Tubbs, quote, there's plenty of cold cuts in the refrigerator. Make sure she gets her 3 a.m. feeding. Sicko. I'm just Whatever that means. <laughs> like I don't know, but I baby. bet you Tubbs could go for some Mc- McDowell's at this point. <laughs> John was waiting for that joke. He's waiting out. <laughs> Cindy's in the room. She's on the phone with a friend. Tubbs goes and checks on her. Everything's fine. He then goes, for some odd reason, he goes over and steals the film out of Cindy's camera, lays down on the couch, turns off the light, and goes to sleep. The film from the camera never yeah, becomes and, and a thing. How, no, I think – no, no. I think, Okay, it does become a thing, and I just realized this because remember when the teenage girl, she was like taking pictures, and she took a picture of Danielle, mm. right? And then he takes a picture over to – Oh, yeah. Yeah, Judy, later okay. on, he's like, run this through whatever, like, international, I don't mm-hmm. know, the international database and look for it, reverse it as a, and I'm spoiling everybody, but <laughs> reverse it uh, <laughs> as for the criminal search. And so she mm-hmm. does, and that's where she finds it because he took the film and he took a picture of, and had a picture of Danielle on there. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So what bothers me with this scene is how he turns off the light. Do you see him just loosen the light bulb to turn off the light? Yeah. What's with what that? An Hit the switch. <laughs> exactly. Who does this? The switch. <laughs> There's got to be a switch, Tubbs. Lazy ass up and hit the switch. <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm glad his car gets stolen. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Cindy's in a room plotting away. Her plan is that she's going to go see her boyfriend in the hospital, David, in the hospital. is going to have her friend come pick her up. She's going to sneak out, have her friend come pick her up, and then go over and see her boyfriend. And this goes off without a hitch. Tubbs. He just passes out on the couch. She sneaks out the back door, climbs over the wall, hops in the car with her friend, and makes it over to the hospital. Tubbs wakes up just a few seconds later and is able – he calls Switek and says, send some backup over to the hospital. I know exactly where she's going. It's obvious. Teenage – dumb teenage girl is going to go see her boyfriend. So, hold on. I, I, I was a little confused because I thought she stole Tub Tubbs' car. No, no. Her girlfriend was waiting. I was waiting. confused. <laughs> well, does she? Her girlfriend has a convertible that looks a lot like Tubbs. I, oh, I maybe. Was just I, maybe I didn't pay attention to that. I, I don't think I, so. Though. I thought she had stolen Tubbs' car, and I was like, "Wait a minute! Did she stop and pick her friend up, <laughs> and like she still beat them to the hospital?" <laughs> yeah, no. I think they're, they're insinuating like the friend had a car and she picked her up, and it's not Tubbs' car. It's something. It is a different car because Tubbs pulls up in his car. Well, I just thought he had multiple because then there's the question: How many convertibles does Tubbs have? <laughs> <laughs> Multiple. <laughs> Over at the hospital, 
Luigi from the Mario Brothers. <laughs> he's there comes to in. fix your pipes. <laughs> <laughs> he comes into the hospital and he's this happens a little bit earlier. He uses his phone. He sorry, he pretends like he's the phone company or a plumber or something. I don't know, but he works he sneaks into the hospital and he hooks he's up. Some a guy. Phone. He just comes in. He does something. I don't know what the hell he's doing. It turns out turns out there's a ladder on the ba- back of the building, like by a dumpster, and you can just climb right up there. You don't even need to talk to anybody. <laughs> well, he taps into the phone switchboard, he hears the phone conversation between David and Cindy, so he knows that she's coming. He sets up a sniper rifle across the parking lot and when Tubbs comes in and gets Cindy and grabs her, takes her out of the room. And I was fully expecting David to be shot and killed here, but it's close, close. He takes Cindy out of the hospital and is going to take her over to Switek's waiting van. Unfortunately, no one is paying attention because Bandy stands up with his sniper rifle and hits Cindy in the leg misses, okay, but then so repels just, down the from this from the roof and gets off into the night. Well, of course he so did. No I one's going to catch him. This is what's At the beginning of the scene, he's going through everything. He's like, I got my rope, I got my duct tape, got my climbing gear. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, oh yeah, gun, gun, need my gun. <laughs> and this has got to be like the worst assassination attempt in history. He shoots his target in the leg and then rappels down 20 feet from his intended target and a police officer and runs off into the night, all while they are right in front of a hospital. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, yeah. How is this ever going to work? I think what happened was the boyfriend, David, comes out and yells. Remember, he's, like, waving at her. He comes out, like, for, first of all, let's address how the hell he get out there so fast if he's in a wheelchair <laughs> with a broken <laughs> arm and leg. Or anything. Yeah, and so he, he, he sees her, and he's like, bye. And then he sees her, the guy across the way, and he's like, oh, my God, look. And then he shoots her. Yeah, so he screws t- it up, basically, for him. Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's, he's a professional. Yelling, hey, does it make you miss? <laughs> Terrible shot. That's what he is. Also, I have one of those phones that plugs in and you can just listen to people's phone calls. <laughs> Creepy. Turns out it's a lot it's cool. easier than you think. <laughs> yes, yes. The next morning at the precinct, Crockett hears the city's going to be okay. She, everything's going to be fine. Inspector Dan- Danielle comes in and Crockett tells her and she's unimpressed. He says that. Crockett says that Cindy's going to be okay, and she and Danielle's like, not if your partner is watching her. Truer words have <laughs> never been spoken on this show. <laughs> yeah, well, she needs to just keep her mouth shut. So <laughs> someone finally gets it. You are I, not safe under vice protection. <laughs> particularly, I still tough. don't understand what what she's exactly doing there or how she's helping at this point. She's not. She's just coming in saying the obvious things. <laughs> she's All she's doing is flirting with Crockett. I mean, that's basically it. <laughs> and he's so desperate, he just falls right for it. <laughs> well, then, for some reason, we leave the precinct and we head over to Danielle's hotel. I don't know if they spend the whole day together. Who knows? It looks like it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But for some reason, Crockett has to escort Daniel, D- Danielle back over to her hotel. She's explaining the backstory on Bondi. They get to her room and she's like, hey, so you going to come in? Like, are we going to do this thing? I'm not here to do any police work. I'm just here to bang you, Crockett. So you want to come in? <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> no. Remember, she tells him it's, it's late. Remember, isn't that where she tells him, like, it's really late. I got to go. And we're mm-hmm. all like, why is it late? It's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? It's getting late. It's bright. She what? had a little too much at brunch, and now she's a little loopy. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> but she lays it on thick, and Crockett's like, nah, puts on his sunglasses, and he leaves. Out at Crockett's boat that night, Tubbs comes over, and Crockett is in the process of feeding Elvis. We finally have an Elvis sighting. And it's been, what, 15 <laughs> episodes since we last time we've seen Elvis? It's been, been forever. Yeah. I thought he was a pair of boots at this point. <laughs> Tubbs comes in and says he's allergic to a crocodile, and Crockett is not in a good mood. He's like, alligator, alligator. Like, damn, Crockett. <laughs> Take a joke. <Damn. laughs> <laughs> Tubbs comes in and just basically says that he is, he is leery about Danielle, and he wants to track, he wants to, Get some more information on her. And Crockett's like, you do your thing. I have nothing to be suspicious of her on. But if you want to do those things, go for it. You can tap her phone. You can follow around. Just just go for it. I like how he has to. Why does he have to give permission? Shouldn't it be uh, Castillo giving permission? Yeah, yeah exactly. Why is he reporting to Crockett? 
I don't know. Okay, <laughs> okay if I sure. tap girlfriend's phone. I don't know. Okay, maybe he's giving them a heads up. Like, I don't. None of those late night sex phone calls to her. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to have to listen to that. <laughs> also, who's protecting the witness right now? <laughs> She's good. They got all, like a, like what do you say, Fort Knox at the ho- at the hospital right now. No one can yeah. get in there, and that's good because we're I never going to talk about her again. <laughs> I, I am fearing for her life right now. No one else seems to care. Don't you know she's going to marry a prince soon? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Well, I think the good news here is that Vice isn't isn't babysitting her anymore. The regular Miami Miami Police Department is, so that's why no one's worried about it anymore. Yeah, because the actual real policemen are doing it <laughs> in the hospital where she was shot in front of. <laughs> True. <laughs> Let's not forget the assassin made it to the roof and then rappelled down the side of the building once already. <laughs> but the no, next... no, let's just keep her there. <laughs> the next morning at the precinct, we come in and Castillo was chastising Tubbs for his performance in protecting the witness prior. <laughs> Crockett is still interviewing Danielle. And I don't know what she's wearing in this scene. She wearing like a toilet seat cover as a shirt or something. I don't know. It's like she had a, like, I have a striped dress. I should actually add a toilet bowl cover to my, <laughs> I don't know. It's like that or it looks kind of like a, like a, I don't know, like a, um, updated sailor outfit or something. I don't know what the hell it is. <laughs> maybe it's foreshadowing for her involvement with that Greenpeace boat at the end. Yeah, maybe. She's really a sailor. <laughs> 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 They're all in a meeting. The entire vice team is in a meeting with Castillo. What what Castillo is saying is that Bandy has been spotted at the Blue Waters Hotel. He, we can confirm that he's in his room. Danielle is saying that Bandy or Bandy is crazy. He'll do anything. Be prepared when you go out there. The vice team is going to go check it out. Danielle says it might be a trap. It's and it, it's. Let's just stop. This is the shortest briefing ever. Okay. Hey, he was spotted over here. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, she warns them, and they're like, "Shut up, you're French," and then they just go. <laughs> like, no one puts together a plan. There's no like, why was this briefing called? Couldn't they have just called and said, "Hey, he was seen over here. Go there." <laughs> what? Well, there's also this long staring contest between Danielle and Tubbs at the end of the briefing, where they're just signaling to each other that they don't trust one another and i also want to point out here because we confirm in the next like blue waters blue waters why does that sound so familiar and when we make it to the next scene over at the blue waters hotel i'm like oh that's why it's the abandoned hotel that was in the episode the maze you're not supposed to know that <laughs> stop spoiling it <laughs> not only is, is that where the sugar robbery went down <laughs> no it is it's the where one- the ep- episode was being rains in it yes where mm. they have the uh they have tubs held he's held <laughs> captive inside of the abandoned building sorry and he's like a drift that's a the Jamaican one he goes drifter. in and he's singing yes. yes yes that one yeah he's promoting the song from his album then they hold Can him we talk about captive. him not making any money uh, again <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then that episode ends where they get everyone on the roof and then they just kill everyone. You know, life style. Yeah, Pretty much. you know. <laughs> so, and Happily then, ever after. So the, the Blue Waters is a real hotel in Miami at the time, but it was abandoned. And you can tell in this episode, it worked for the maze because everything was dilapidated and, and run down. But in this scene, he's like staying at this giant hotel and it's still the same thing. There's garbage all over the hallway, parts of the walls missing. The sign is falling down off the outside of the hotel. And yeah, so he's it's a comfort in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> the duo in Switek, no Zito for some reason, they get into the room to go trying to arrest Bondi, but he set a trap. There's a Switek trip so he has a trip wire and pulls a grenade. They're all able to jump out just in time, but it explodes. Luckily, all the other tenants are um people who are staying in the hotel don't get hurt it just it's the explosion is self-contained in that one room and luckily it, it took it like signals in time for them to jump out of the way <laughs> it makes like a loud clicking well, noise it, and then crockett jump <laughs> <laughs> it took it like two minutes for it to go off that like they went running out and they like jumped and climbed down and then it went off it took forever to explode <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do want to point out, fantastic work by Crockett clearing the closet right before they trip over the wire. <laughs> Back at Hire's Hotel, or 
Danielle's hotel. Crockett's basically running back over there because he knows now that Danielle knew what was going to happen. She was kind of foreshadowing that it wasn't worth to go investigate this. He's a dangerous man. And he comes in and she's talking to two other men about moving some morphine. Suspicious. She, she's she's got on her Friday night dress um, <laughs> here, and she's working hard to get some free drinks at the bar. And Crockett comes in and kind of ruins her mojo. <laughs> what happens after? I think is what she want. She wanted him to show up and see that because she starts laying it on really thick with him. Starts, you know, she like climbs on top of him and tells him that they start kissing they come up with a plan on how they're gonna get bondy while they're kissing yeah, and then we, and she's we getting get... them drunk too she's feeding <laughs> yes. them alcohol like... <laughs> and then we get to a real crockett sex scene not like where he kisses someone then it fades out and you come back and it's the next morning no Real fornication from Sunny Crockett. <laughs> yep, the down and the dirty. I've been waiting. And then European <laughs> girls are freaks. <laughs> I'm waiting. I had to sit through tub sweaty feet scenes to get to this. <laughs> 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 and they have like the weirdest sex positions while they're going through this. This is one where they're like both kneeling and Crockett's behind her. And I've written down like, is it like the crouching Buddha? What do they call this one? It's the the wheel, the wheelbarrow it, ride? It, it's the log ride. You know, like when you go on the log ride, you kind of like sit in your lap. Well, Melissa, you call it, what what'd you call it? The Miami? The moon's over my hammy. <laughs> 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 or the the Miami piggyback. Yeah, that's why I said we we could call it the moon over Miami Miami piggyback ride. <laughs> <laughs> it works on so many levels. So. Post fornication. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking about when she's wearing that robe with the giant um, uh, shoulder pads in it. It's like, why the hell do you need shoulder pads in a robe? What the hell is going on? When the piggyback ride is over, she puts on a robe with shoulder pads and the phone rings. Crockett answers and Tubbs is like, hey, what's happening? <laughs> he goes, hey, what's going on? Like he knew they had sex. He's like, I, I sensed you had sex. What is going on? <laughs> Tubbs tells Crockett that Danielle's been talking to someone back in Paris. They, they can't find any information on the guy. He looks like he's clean. And then Tubbs ends the conversation. There like, well, no Danielle. Have fun. There's only Zool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the next morning, Tubbs goes into the precinct and he goes to talk to a real cop. Trudy. And yeah, she's... this is classic tubs. This is classic tubs. Hey, Trudy, could you do my for me? Here's a picture. Do that thing you do with the computer stuff. <laughs> for the record here, Tubbs is the only one doing real police work. He's the one that figures all of this out. Oh, sorry. Trudy obviously does a lot of the police <laughs> well, work yeah, here. Yeah, she does it for him. <laughs> yes. yes. I'm pretty sure Pretty sure Trudy's the one doing the heavy lifting on this part. <laughs> but yes, a lot more than Crockett given getting piggyback rides. <laughs> um, so I, I like to point out at this point, this international criminal came all the way to Miami to steal morphine. He is mm -hmm. still in Miami, still trying to sell morphine. The morphine he stole in the same city he stole it. With people looking for him. And, and this guy avoided the Mounties at the Canadian border. So <laughs> Yeah, who uh, knows I why just, he doesn't travel? He can go wherever he wants to. Yeah. I mean, don't they like morphine in New York or... Well, I think he can't Chicago. get out because of, um, like, they already know. Like, all the authorities know, right? Think about it. Mm -hmm. if, if Interpol knows... And the everyone else knows then. So like maybe he can't fly out. Maybe that's why. But but I still don't understand what he was going to do after he sold it though. <laughs> get that part. Like what are you gonna do? how are you going to get out? You weren't going to yeah. magically not be wanted anymore. <laughs> exactly. The the most important thing that happens here is that Tubbs tells Trudy to run her picture, to run Danielle's picture through the database for criminals, not for through police. Make sure she's a police officer, but run it through to see if she's a wanted criminal. We have a brief scene where Danielle tells. Castillo that Crockett has coordinated a buy with the two men she was talking to at the hotel at the fancy ball they were having at the hotel and then we also and then we end it with seeing that Crockett is explaining to those two guys that Bondi's gonna call they're gonna answer and set up a meet Bondi so does call they just lucked into finding the two guys that he's gonna sell the morphine to well she knows no, them she, she, she through the Interpol them. connections yeah. mm -hmm. through, through Interpol they found them so basically Interpol set it up undercover 
to meet with her. But he just stole the morphine yesterday. True. <laughs> Did he actually go all the fly, break through customs, go all the way to Miami? Busy pre planned to steal morphine from a delivery truck at a hospital. Oh yeah, no, it was pre planned. That's why he was he went there specifically to that hospital and said he was for three years. Yeah, and said he was that doctor and all that. Yeah. At what luckily Bondi calls right then and they get to listen in on him Bondi whoops. They get to listen in on Bondi kill a bellhop and then trick Tub to escapes out the back door. So because one thing we, we skipped there is that I believe that's the same bellhop that just parked Tub's car. Oh yeah. Um yeah, yeah it is. And so Tub's gonna have a hell of a time finding his car now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the important part. Where is Tub's car? Where have you parked it? <laughs> he gets a hell of a head start. Especially because he, he gives him an extra tip too. He's like here Park this somewhere where, where it's going to be safe. So <laughs> it's at a different hotel. He's never going to be able to find it. <laughs> yes. In the hotel room, Tubbs, who's done real police work, because he heard on a phone tap with Danielle that they knew exactly what hotel room he was in, went on his own to go bring down Bondi, but Bondi catches on because the bellhop comes in and tells him that there's a man downstairs looking for him. So then Bondi kills the bellhop, takes his clothes, leaves him like the horse head in Godfather inside of the (laughs) hotel bed and sneaks out the back door. no tip. Yeah, no tip. (laughs) No tip for that information, no. (laughs) Well, you could at least tip housekeeping because, I mean, they have to come in and clean this crap up. (laughs) Yeah, they have to clean up that body. (laughs) Crockett is listening to the entire thing, but luckily nothing happens to Tubbs. Back at the precinct. <laughs> nothing yeah. happens. It, takes, it took him like three hours to get back to the precinct because he couldn't <laughs> f- figure out where the kid parked his car. <laughs> Never mind the poor kid that just dies and it's like all, oh, they can hear that guy being murdered. Like, that's disturbing. <laughs> Man, don't, don't think about that, though. <laughs> think about Tubbs' car. <laughs> <laughs> we have a longer scene at the precinct next, but it really comes down to two points. Castillo tells Tubbs not to be a Lone Ranger anymore, and it comes out that Danielle is talking to her people back at Interpol that knew that know exactly where Bondi is, and she's not sharing the information. That night at Crockett's boat, Danielle comes over in her evening gown. She comes <laughs> her over evening to- jumpsuit, really. It was a jumpsuit. <laughs> <laughs> she comes to see Crockett. She's confident that Bondi's going to call back. He always wants to make the deal. Crockett asked her why she didn't say anything about knowing all of this stuff and why, like, who this Zolan guy is back in France. But he, they don't get any information out of this. The only thing that happens here is that she says, hey, I saw my stay in the night. And he's like, no, we got big plans tomorrow. I need you to get a good night's sleep. Now get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> she interrupted to them. He's he's sitting there and he's trying to catch Elvis's dinner, you know, or else he's going to have a pissed off gator all night. <laughs> <laughs> she just shows up like, hey, you know, you want bones? It's like, well, I got responsibility. I got to feed this gator. <laughs> <laughs> I can't bone when my gator's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> that scene right before this where they're at the precinct. I think it's funny. Every time Tubbs and Crockett got to talk, like they got to follow each other into the bathroom. You know? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but, like, like, go ahead and tell me. But, but follow me into the bathroom because I got to poop first. <laughs> Got kind of multitask. I can hear you. Time to wait. I can hear you from in the stall. <laughs> Back at Danielle's hotel, she's taking a nice bubble bath. <laughs> Tubbs comes in and says, I know who you are. I'm not going to sell anyone anything. You just need to leave. You better split. You're out messing with my best friend. Get out of here. And then he leaves. More bathroom talk. Did, did you guys notice that big creepy face above the bathroom, <laughs> yeah. by the way? It was like a... Like some sort of mask, like but it was yeah, it giant, was like a mask, like yeah. the size of a car. I, I'm the only yeah. one that, that was creeped out by the fact that Tubbs just broke into someone's room and then walked in on her taking a bath and then creepily <laughs> like went and turned the water off just, and she was naked. Like, was, what kind of violation is that? <laughs> I was just distracted by the giant mask that looked like it could fall and squish her at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Luxury tub. At the precinct the next morning, they finally get the call from Bondi. They set up the meet. It's going to be at Jackson Park at 10 a.m. Castillo just says, be careful. There's a lot of civilians. He's going to run if he sees anyone else. So, oh, sorry, it's not 10 a.m. It's 10 p.m. Oh, I was going to say, it's really dark if it's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> What's wrong with the time in Miami? <laughs> Later that evening, Tubbs meets Crockett on his boat, and he tells Crockett what the deal is. She's a terror. She's a terrorist. Now, this is a our moment, our first moment in Miami Vice, where it's a ripped from the headlines moment. He says, "Remember, she's a spook. Remember that thing with the Greenpeace boat back in New Zealand? That's a real thing. I talked about it in this week in Vice. What happened was the French." We're going to do some nuclear testing off this island that was out near New Zealand so, or near enough that the green the Greenpeace boat, the Rainbow Warrior, was docking in New Zealand and then was going to head out there as a protest to stop the nuclear test. The French, whatever the French CIA is, sent some people to infiltrate the Greenpeace group, then plant bombs on the Rainbow Warrior and blow it up so that it couldn't go out. And, and protest the nuclear testing. Unfortunately, when the quote-unquote spooks, as they call them in this show, planted the bombs, one person ran back onto the boat, and when they detonated it, it killed him. Eventually, this news got out, and those resignations all over the place, a gigantic international story that was ordered by the French government to sink the Rainbow Warrior. And that's what Tubbs is croc talking about to Crockett, that she was one of those people with the French CIA that helped sink that boat. That's why she's so a does criminal. That make yeah. Bandy, does that make Bandy the French Jason Bourne? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why Bandy is running from them and why Danielle wants to kill him is because he's he's flipped. He's on the run. He knows too much to need to kill him. Just like an episode early in the season where there was a one with where it was um Castillo's friend that had flipped and they were trying to hunt him down. Yeah. And that's why she so keeps wait, warning wait, that Bondi is such a badass. So wait, it has nothing to do with the morphine. <laughs> no. <laughs> Damn <Yeah>. it. <laughs> Once again, foiled by Miami Vice writing that what started the episode, it does not matter at the end of the episode. Much like Wasn't that there toy. a witness? <laughs> nah, she's gone now. <laughs> Much like the smash the toy race car last week, everything before this <laughs> d didn't matter. <laughs> hey, you know what? I can think of another show that does that all the time, too. The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> they do that every episode, right? Like the first five minutes, you're like, oh, this is going to be about this. Nope. It's about Homer being an alcoholic. Oh, wait. <laughs> you leave them out of this and your mouth. <laughs> Truth hurts, huh? <laughs> so now we go to the final scene of the episode. We are at... Which, which, which they say is a park, but I don't think it's a park. No, it's not. It's like a shopping center <laughs> by the water or something. <laughs> but they said it was a park. Or a harbor, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Bondi shows up. The, the deal starts. And then Bondi, who's changed no, his mind about no, no, selling. No, no, no. Don't just jump right into Bandy showing up. No. A guy who rolls through with his boat, and they think this is, might be Bandy drives by and then it's a false alarm and then bandy <laughs> shows up and realizes man i should have been i should have snagged a boat <laughs> <laughs> he regrets it damn like, so stupid like, now that would have been a fantastic boat. idea <laughs> <laughs> also there's the joking that goes on between zito and gina about how how fast he is in the bed too <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget about that part. <laughs> Bondi pulls a gun. He's going to take the money from the buyer and keep the drugs. Crockett runs and pushes the man into the water at the last second so that he doesn't get shot by Bondi. Bondi takes off running. And this is where we where are the final moments here. Tubbs takes off and is able to catch up to Bondi as a bridge, a drawbridge is going up. Fans. <laughs> Tubbs catches up to him as he runs across his bridge. He turns the corner just in time to see Danielle shoot and kill Bondi. She walks up. So this is hilarious too because they start running up the bridge as the bridge is going up. You can see as the bridge is going up, it's getting more difficult to run up. And so Bandy jumps over and then Tubbs jumps over. And then we get this scene of Crockett struggling up the <laughs> steep, steep bridge <laughs> yeah. as Why it's is going he up. Still trying. Why is he even still trying to climb up it? We don't know don't why. Know. <laughs> well, I don't it's a know. good thing he, he did, though, right? Such a... <laughs> I can't. I just, it's just hilarious. Like he's at one point, like he's like trying to climb up the uh, side <laughs> like it's a wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, he gets to the top just at the right moment. 
Danielle walks up and hands Tubbs her gun, says that uh, that he had a big mouth. When he hands her a gun, Tubbs puts it in his waistband, turns around. She pulls another gun and says that Tubbs has a big mouth and that she's going to take care of him. Crockett finally gets up to the top, sees what's happening, pulls his gun, shoots and kills Danielle right before she pulls the trigger to kill Tubbs. End of the episode. Oh, Everyone's dude, dead. shot her in the neck, too. <laughs> oh, man. Totally cold blood, like right in the neck. <laughs> but again, now drugs don't matter. The witness doesn't. So the witness got shot. The Bondi is killed. Danielle is killed. This is everyone is dead. And the, what the storyline at the beginning of the episode didn't matter by the time we got to the end. Can Pretty I much. ask what happened to the morphine? <laughs> it's gone, John. Get That's over it. Mysteriously <laughs> in a spot where there's an alligator. <laughs> Jeez. I don't know. Maybe an unarmed El Gato aide will have it in a later episode. <laughs> maybe. Maybe he maybe he thinks he's some kind of tourism director. I don't know. <laughs> This, like I say, it came together at the end. It's just, it's not how it started. But let's go, let's first go talk about the music and then we'll give our final thoughts. All right, John, as you know, every week I take a sneak peek to see what the music is. I was shocked, shocked when I saw this week's music. So yeah, we have Who's Zooming Who by Aretha Franklin. <laughs> and and a great it. song title. The name of the song yeah. is hilarious. Yeah. yeah, that's all. It's just one little song. So, gotta Yo, kill normally. some time. We'll try and whistle a little bit. <laughs> You know, normally when we have an episode of very little music, it's because Castillo is samurai and fools in between palm trees, but not this week. Nope, not this week. So <laughs> let's see. What can we say about Who's Zooming Who? It is Aretha Franklin's 33rd studio album. It was released in the summer of 1985. Gee, I wonder why they chose it. <laughs> it. it <laughs> the album was her first ever platinum record, sold in excess of a million records. So Who's Zooming Who actually reached number two. Franklin's other song, Freeway of Love, off the other album, actually reached number one. So it was the second most popular song on the album. Maybe it, song, didn't, uh, quite, so- maybe it didn't quite reach number one because people are still trying to figure out who's zooming. <laughs> <laughs> who's zooming? Who did it? So Aretha Louise. Franklin, born in 1942 in Memphis, Tennessee. She sang gospel at her father's church. Her father was a minister, actually a rather famous minister known as C.L. Franklin. Um, But we'll get to that in a minute. She has over 18 Grammys, sold over 75 million records. She was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987. She has 112 charted singles. That means over 100 songs have landed on the Billboard Top 100 something, which is just insane. Yeah, that's crazy. That is crazy. Uh, she uh, actually she got a record deal by the age of 18, but saw modest success. It wasn't until the end of the 60s that she would claim the title Queen of Soul with songs like Respect, A Natural Woman, and Think. She also had appearances in the Blues Brothers movie. I, I want to jump in. I want to talk about two things, mostly with Aretha Franklin. Uh, one is, is that her dad was a really, really well-known pastor, and he eventually became the pastor at the New Bethel Baptist Church in Detroit. And he was known for his emotionally driven sermons so much that he was one of the first pastors to actually record his sermons and distribute them. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, because of his notoriety, when Aretha was growing up, it wasn't odd for her father or her home to be visited by Martin Luther King Jr. or Sam Cooke. Or Jackie Wilson. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the people showing up for dinner. In 1979, on June 10th, her dad would be shot twice at point blank range in what they would eventually rule as a suspected robbery at his own house. The crazy part is, so it, it, it was never solved, but the crazy part is, is that he ended up in a coma for five years. 
Wow. So it wasn't like he is either A, he died or B, he, he recovered and then he was back out there. It's like, no, it took five years. Yeah. For five years, basically, he lived and went from the hospital to his house with a nurse to a nursing home. But yeah, I mean, he was shot in 79 and he didn't pass away until 1984. Wow. That's um, a long time. Yeah. Yeah, so kind of crazy. And I guess, I, I guess it, I mean, it was definitely suspicious that, uh, I, I guess there was something suspicious about it being a robbery, but that's, you know, like I said, it was never solved. Yeah, it's also suspicious based on the type of people that he had around, um, and then that era. It's just, it's suspicious all over. Yeah. The other things of interest that you might not know is that following an incident, in 1984, the same year her father passed away, basically what I read was, following an incident, she became scared of flying, and she hasn't toured outside of North America since. Hey, something yes. me and Aretha Franklin have in common, uh, which uh, I won't be able to say about almost anything, because I'm not an amazing singer, songwriter, actor, but we have we both get nervous about flying. <laughs> <laughs> and you've never toured outside North America. <laughs> True. I mean, it's Aretha Franklin, so she still is honored in all kinds of different ways. If you talk mm -hmm. about, she did something in the '90s where she sang some kind of opera thing and got a got a bunch of uh, claim for that. But I mean, it's Aretha freaking Franklin. So yeah, um, exactly. I, Anything she touches I, is amazing. So yeah. So I guess the one bonus is, is that from everything I can tell, she does not know or is associated in any way with Phil Collins. <laughs> take that. Finally. Take that Phil. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I say I'm disappointed. Although I enjoy all the stuff about Aretha Franklin. I'm let down that this episode really only had one song i am too because it just i mean it's kind of interesting you know about her dad or fear of flying but the lack of music and it's tough it's tough to do a whole segment around just one song it barely even yeah. had any jan hammer music there was only one jan hammer song in the episode too yeah yeah uh i believe entitled candy <laughs> well let's go over and give our final thoughts on this episode because i have a feeling it's going to be mixed <laughs> all right john how about you kick us off this week what are your final thoughts on this episode kind of two episodes the beginning was about morphine and killer doctors and teenagers and then there was this whole other episode <laughs> about crockett banging French chicks and <laughs> something to do with a jawbridge. Uh, <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, like it just, it, it's, it's one of those, it's classic Miami Vice in that there are certain, there are whole parts of the episode that make zero sense. But then there are other parts where it's like everything kind of comes together and it's like, oh, you know, the end was kind of cool with a lot of the little stuff, like a lot of the Crockett stuff with the C French pool chick i could have taken it i could have left it and there was no freaking music <laughs> so i think john's just bitter because there was no music for him to <laughs> research <laughs> i am I, I i honestly am i would say you're right it's two it's two different episodes and what i've noticed the theme here in this in the second season is that we have a lot of same story arcs just with the different characters as the main people. So the last episode that we, the, ep the episode I keep thinking of in this, where we have a CIA agent that's gone rogue and the, the, their CIA is trying to bring him down is in Bushido, which with Castillo trying to protect his, his CIA buddy's family who had gone rogue. This is just. That Castillo, the same Ca Castillo story, just with Tubbs and Crockett now. Just like where we had the two weeks in, a, we had the two weeks where Crockett fell for someone who was a criminal, and then we had the next week where Tubbs fell for someone who was a criminal. So this is we're like re already rehashing some storylines. What I did like about this though is they called it French Twist, and they delivered on the twist. This episode flips over three or four times based on what you think is going to happen and what it ends up being about by the time it gets to the end. I also really enjoyed the rip from the headlines aspect to it, which we're going to get a bunch of when we get into season three. So I'm actually pretty excited about that. I like that, that they brought that up and added that to the episode. So as I mentioned, it was a kind of a slow build, but when it got to the end, I enjoyed it. I actually kind of liked this episode. Melissa, 
What are your final thoughts? I don't like this episode. <laughs> <laughs> except for the except for the Crockett sex scene, which I've been waiting for for a long time. <laughs> Even though it was awkward and very strange, at least it was Crockett getting some finally. Cubs always gets it. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, I don't like this episode because I don't like the girl. It's just the whole entire thing. It bugs me. She bugs me the entire time because she's so obviously behind doing something shady that it's not. Well, I mean, I know she broke kid and play, but. Um... <laughs> no, not her. <laughs> the French girl. I'm pushing that can't be that bad. <laughs> you know, no, I'm just saying like the whole entire time that, that she's supposed to be like helping them, you know, she's and not helping them. it was them. play, not kid. I yeah, mean, exactly. I think that's a big. <laughs> that's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't like this episode. I told you from the beginning. I'm like, I don't like this episode. I don't, I don't, it's, it's boring to me. And I don't want to rip it apart too bad. There are some good parts to it, but I think I would have liked it if they would have stuck with like the story with the witness and all that. Finish that story out rather Mm -hmm. than go this whole other direction. I do like the part of the rip to the headlines and I do like that um, that that's coming up and that I know season three is my favorite season. So and I know what happens in it. So, I mean, I know that stuff's coming and there's going to be more of that. And I I do enjoy that part of it because at that time, no one was doing that cop shows weren't doing that at the time so that's cool i just i just didn't like the direction it took pick one be about crockett having sex with this french girl or be about <laughs> i don't know and don't do that back to back or whatever <laughs> no more moves over my hammy <laughs> no more moves over my hammy all right i can't take it it's weird no. someone give me a piggyback ride <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> no more Miami piggyback rides. I don't know, but I mean it's it's cool that um that uh that for once Tubbs figures stuff out instead of being the idiot, right? Because usually he's like, <laughs> hey, Tubbs Sorry. is the is the only real police officer on on that whole force. Um, excuse me, Trudy is the backbone of the whole entire true force. This is true. So that's my thoughts, Trudy. But where would we be without Trudy? She does everything. <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm still trying to figure out that awkward scene from last week's episode <laughs> where the where the son taps dad on the elbow. I've watched that clip about a hundred times now. But we hope that you enjoyed this episode and all the quirkiness that showed up in this episode of Miami Vice and this M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong twist that we got at the end <laughs> that into this episode. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. We would love to hear from you. Email the show, go with the heat at gmail.com. You can also get us on Twitter. You can get us on Facebook. You can find all the ways to contact us on that website, go with the heat.com. Our podcast is officially on tune in podcast. So if you're a subscriber on tuning and you want to have all your radio and podcasts in one spot, you can get us there, but you can also get us on Google play iTunes. I guess if you want to do it through YouTube or Stitcher, you can pretty much find us anywhere. You can subscribe. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye pal. Thank you.